Hi, I'm Faye. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I'm just going to talk really quickly. Well, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be quick. <laughs> I do have a tendency to ramble on. I'm going to be talking about a principle that's very, very important to me when it comes to raising a child with autism or any additional need, really, or any child in general, you can apply this principle to. So what I think you must do is presume competence in that child. I'm not sure exactly who coined this term, but it is a familiar term in the autistic self-advocacy community, which are autistic adults that advocate for themselves uh, and on behalf of autistics as a whole. Presuming competence is assuming that a child or an adult with additional needs has the ability to learn, to think and to understand even if you don't see any obvious evidence that that is the case. Sorry, just to give you a bit of background, my son is three years, three and a half years old. He was uh, diagnosed with autism when he just turned three and he is essentially non-verbal. He is starting with some word approximations. Uh, I will link his communication update. And he is just like many, many children on the spectrum, a very bright child. However, many, many professionals that have worked with him have made assumptions about what he can understand, uh, how he thinks, um, because quite often it doesn't seem like he's absorbing what's going on. He tends to lack the social motivation to show you that he is understanding. He doesn't follow many neurotypical social cues like eye contact. But I have found time and time again that he has surprised me by showing me later or in other ways that he actually was listening and it was going in. Presuming competence, I feel, is especially important in children who are non-verbal or very minimally verbal, even down to young toddlers. We seem to have linked an inability to speak with an inability to think. Children tend to gain um, receptive language and understanding at a quicker rate than expressive language. They can almost always understand more than they can express. Um, with children who are autistic or developing differently, that gap can be quite wide. I also wanted to point out that understanding is not just about understanding verbal language. We're also talking about how a child understands the world around them and how things interact with each other, how things work. There have been a couple that I'm aware of probably more, a couple of clinical, bit large scale clinical trials that have proven that children who were non-verbal or minimally verbal um, in many, many cases had high non-verbal intelligence. You can't measure intelligence in a child with different brain wiring in the same way that you measure intelligence in a neurotypical child. A lot of tests of cognitive intelligence that we use are based on the ability to express themselves through language. Just because a test comes back and tells you that your child is incapable of certain things doesn't necessarily mean that they are. And also, presuming competence means if you have a child who hasn't yet gained a skill, it is assuming that they have the ability to gain it. Because it is the least dangerous assumption to make. Think about it this way. If you assume a child is competent and you act like they are, what is the worst that's happened if you look back over time? Maybe you've you've wasted some time going through things that, that they weren't ready to, to understand. But then think of it the other way around. Three words, self-fulfilling prophecy. If you constantly treat your child like they can't do something, then you're setting the bar here and it will be very hard for them to achieve above that bar. If you set the bar here, they have much more chance of reaching that. And that is proven, by the way, in research. There's been a, a lot of research on expectations and how that impacts learning and, and achievements in children. Presuming competence is not about setting unrealistic expectations for your child or setting them up to fail. 
it's not about treating them in a way or speaking to them in a way that makes it harder for them to understand what's going on. Number one is being patient. Sometimes children just require more processing time. Don't jump in to help all the time. Give them time to, to have a go. Give them a gap to communicate in, in any way. If they are verbal, don't finish sentences for them even if you know where they're going with that sentence. Don't leave it to the point of frustration, but always give them a chance. You have to keep expecting that one day the child will be able to respond in an appropriate way, even if it takes them more time. Also, use an age-appropriate tone of voice when you speak to them. Don't speak to them like you would a puppy. And this has happened so many times to my son. I find people either ignore him or talk to him like he's a dog. Don't use a tone of voice that you wouldn't use on a neurotypical child of the same age. It's, it's very helpful to simplify language and, and be clear and direct when you talk to children who are autistic and struggle with language processing. But this is about tone of voice. I've been guilty of this numerous times. Uh, it's something I need to work on myself. Always try and think creatively when presenting learning opportunities to your child. If you're constantly trying to teach a differently wired child with conventional methods, um, you may not have very much success, but that doesn't necessarily say everything about the child's ability to learn. It might be the methods you are using that are the barrier to skill acquisition. Also, speak to the child directly about what's going on and what's happening around them, even if they don't respond. For example, we do lots of things with Dexter. We take him out and about. He, he loves going in the car to and from different places. He's never been particularly um, a child that needs routine. He doesn't often respond though. I will say, let's go to the park. Sometimes he'll nod. Quite often he'll just carry on with what he was doing. It would be very easy for me to just pick him up and plonk him in the car and take him from A to B and talk to my husband in the car and not let him know what's going on or where we go because he doesn't really respond. So because I don't get that feedback from him, it would be very easy for me to assume he's either not interested in what I'm telling him or he's not even understanding what I'm saying and therefore it's pointless. But I talk to him anyway. I tell him all about where we're going, who we're going to see when we get there, what we're going to do when we get there. Um, and there's no expectation on him to respond to me, which is good because quite often he doesn't. And something else that's really important, something that I've had a lot of experience with, something that really, really grinds my gears, is um, to, well, A, not stereotype your own child, but B, to really resist internalizing other people's attempts at stereotyping your child. People make a lot of assumptions based on a label. All children on the spectrum or otherwise are unique. Just treat everyone as the individual that they are. It's quite simple, I don't know why people have such a hard time with it. <laughs> we like to put people in boxes, I find, as humans. We like, we like to have neat little categories for people. <laughs> Nobody fits in neat little categories. And finally, when you're looking for evidence that a person is understanding, look for it in unconventional ways. Don't expect them to look at you and go, yes, I understand what you're saying, now let me ask you a question about what you've just said. It can be something like, if, you're, if your son or daughter likes lining up toys, look at the way in which they're lining them up. Are they grouping them by colour or are they grouping them by number, quantity? There are little subtle clues everywhere and sometimes you've got to play detective. Finally, don't just take my waffling word for it. Look into autistic self-advocates. Listen to stories of people that have lived through this. And I know not all autistic adults are, are capable of um, talking about their experiences in such a articulate way, but they are such a valuable resource to us parents of differently wired children. Tap into that resource, ask them questions. I find it really helpful to follow the journeys of autistic adults who were, in particular, the ones who were non-verbal for a long time or had um, very significant language difficulties early on in their life. 
and just to, to hear them talk about their childhood, um, I really think it makes me a better parent. I don't know what happened there, my camera just went off. Even, even my camera is sick of me ranting on about these things. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna end it there. Uh, congratulations if you got through this. <laughs> Check out our other videos if you want to uh, follow my son's progress and yeah, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, I will see you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye.